Hi, this is Annika, and I am literally sitting on top of a lake. Um, <laughs> this is Lake Trillium in uh, Mount Hood, in the Mount Hood area, and I have only ever been here in the summer, and I know, I know it snows up here, and I knew there was going to be a bunch of snow up here, but for some reason in my head, I still pictured a snowy landscape and a blue lake. <laughs> which makes no sense whatsoever. Um, so instead I ended up taking a hike on the lake and I'm sitting on the snow in the lake. So on the lake, not in the lake, on the lake. <laughs> um, so after I recorded uh, the, uh, the story of how I got triggered by a faucet and how I moved into that trigger, um, I got the question, again, a question I get all the time, which is how, how could I support you? Like how, what does it look like to support, like what kind of support do you need? Or what does it look like to support somebody moving into a trigger? Um, which is really different. There's a lot of, um, a lot of techniques and, um, modalities and tricks and whatnot to get somebody out of a trigger, you know, like focus on these things or, you know, do this breathing technique or, you know, whatever to, to try to get somebody untriggered. And, you know, that's useful in a situation where it's really not a good time or place to go into a trigger, but there's very little um, the information that I've been able to find on how to support somebody moving in to a trigger when a trigger occurs. And that's that's really tragic because especially in safe spaces where triggers are extremely common, exactly precisely because the space is so safe that uh, traumatized parts feel, feel safe enough to come out um, through a trigger, um, there's usually not an awareness on how to move through triggers. There's just the philosophy that triggers should be avoided or that, or even the conflation of triggers with harm, where if somebody is triggered, that's seen as like, as, as harm, that, you know, the person who caused the trigger harmed the person who was triggered, which is not at all true. Um, so I've been giving it some thought on how, wh what is it that I need? Um, mostly, to be honest, I've been doing this work by myself, uh, and there are several reasons for that. Um, but a big part of it is that I, I haven't trusted anyone uh, to step into a trigger with me because the, like, it's, it is so painful for me to step into a trigger and then have somebody try to pull me out of it. That is so excruciatingly painful um, that I just don't want to risk it. So I've been doing a lot of it myself, um, which, which is kind of sad. <laughs> I, mean, I, would, I would love support. <laughs> um, so um, I'm laughing, but inside I think there's a part of me crying. So, um, but yeah, what does it look like? Just keeping it real. <laughs> um, I, cause I do, I, it's true. I mean, I do want support. I would love to have company journeying into a trigger. Um, I do, I would. Um, there are basically two ways that someone can support me or anyone else moving into a trigger um, and meeting with that part that's holding pain and trauma. And one of them is to just be present. I mean, it's, sound, it's simple, but it's not easy. Um, both of those are actually very simple, very simple steps, but very much not easy steps. And it's just to be present without trying to change or fix or help is actually very, very hard. It's not difficult, but it's hard because we're so, we're so wired and trained to get somebody out of pain, like to help somebody out of pain, that to just be present and, and, and be compassionately 
holding space while somebody moves through their pain. Um, and not in a dissociative way. I mean, there's people who say, I'm holding space. And what they're doing is they're just dissociating. And so then the body is there and they're just, whoop. <laughs> they're not really present. That's not present. You know, if you just plop a body there, but the mind just goes, who knows where into dissociation land that's not holding space that's <laughs> um because it's it's not real presence you know um so it's like actually really focusing the attention on the person who's triggered and focusing on the, the attention on that part and really letting that part know that it is being heard so one way that can happen is by reflecting back which is, um, I, when I first started doing this for someone else, I had a lot of resistance because it felt like validating that untrue story, right? So in that trigger with the faucet where, um, you know, the, what I was saying, what that part of me was saying was, uh, nobody cares about me. Um, like I don't deserve to be cared for. Um, you know, the fixing or helping the traditional way would be like, well, that's not true. Look, you know, this person cares and that person cares. And to basically prove that part wrong, at which point that part is going to go, you know, disappear again because it feels it feels like it's not welcome. It's not heard. Um, so really hearing it would look like you feel like nobody ever cares. You feel, you know, like you're you think that you're all alone. You think that you don't deserve to be cared for. Or even just verbatim repeating it back, <laughs> you know, when I say, nobody, nobody cares. Just repeating back, nobody cares, you know. Um, it's so counterintuitive, but it really is powerful. It is so powerful because then that part for the first time ever, <laughs> you know, and for me, I'm 42. So some of those parts have been locked away for 40 years. So for the first time ever, it feels like this is allowed to be here. It's not only allowed to be here, it's being heard. Um, and it doesn't have to change. It doesn't have to be fixed. It can just be here. And the person isn't running away. I mean, that's incredible. That's, in, that's incredible. If you've never experienced that sort of space holding and support, it, I mean, it's just absolutely life-changing. Um, and then the other way is to... Um, is to share impact because it's not always possible to stay present with that. Um, especially, so I know, I know from my own experience, I can be present with someone and hold space for someone for things that I myself have integrated. But if the other person is expressing something that I have not integrated, I actually can't be present. And so then I'll be really tempted to try to fix it, to try to change that person's experience, to try to talk them out of it, reason them out of it, untrigger them, because it's that the pain that they're experiencing is triggering my own pain, um, and I'm not ready to go there myself. So that's those are the times when, you know, when I try to stop somebody's process and, and get them out, and thinking I'm helping them, uh, but I, I'm actually really re. I'm helping them re-suppress that, that traumatized part. So it's actually not, not a great thing. Um, so one way, one way to respond, or the, really the helpful way to respond when I'm trying to hold space for somebody else and it's too much, it's triggering too much of my own pain or I'm too uncomfortable to just be present with it and it's something that I am not comfortable reflecting back to them I can share my own discomfort and share like hey this is how I'm experiencing this right that right now like this is this is so painful like I can't even be with it or you know I am I am I am so wanting to rescue you from this pain right now that I, I can't even, like, I, I don't know what else to do. Like, I can't be present with you. I'm trying, I just really want to fix it. Um, that actually, strangely enough, feels validating too. So when somebody comes back to me and says, you know what, I can't hold space for this. This is too painful. I'm really uncomfortable. 
this feels really wrong or scary or whatever to me. Um, I really want you to have a different experience. I really want to fix this for you. I want you to feel better desperately. Um, what that does for me is that part won't be able to go through the full process, um, the part that's holding the pain, but the rest of me feels validated. It's different. It's not getting just kind of shoved back down. It's more just like, yeah, it's okay for you to be here, but this is actually not the right time and space. Um, and you know, this person is not the right person to hold space for it. And so it lets that part know there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not the right context. And that feels really good too. That feels really helpful to, to hear that this experience isn't wrong or bad or unwelcome in and of itself. It's just not the right place, the right time, the right person for it to come out. And it also validates for the rest of me how hard that is. You know, the part of me that has been suppressing that hurt part all along feels met in the other person. So when the other person says, oh, this is too hard to be with, I can't hold space for this. You know, I feel disappointed. The part of me that wanted to be heard feels disappointed. But then the rest of me feels like, you know what? You're right, this is really hard. Like I can give myself some credit and it's really understandable that I haven't done this work until now because it is really hard. So it feels validating too. Um, so those are, those are the two responses, you know, just be fully present with what's coming up without changing it and just reflect it back and let that part be exactly how it needs to be. And when it gets too much, when there's, when it's, it's going across your boundaries or uh, your capacity to be with it, then name that and just be like, sorry, I can't, you know, <laughs> this is too hard. Um, and that's really what I, that's, I mean, that's the golden ticket right there. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> I get all glowy and excited just imagining, imagining having somebody show up like that for me. Uh, just, just the imagining of it and, and feeling into what it's like. And I've had moments of that. I've had not, never like moments that I sought out. I've never directly asked for that, but I've been in situations where that has happened. And, oh goodness. I mean, there's, there's few things better in the world. Yeah. So I'll leave it here. Um. I'll pop out for a nice view. Well, it doesn't really work. <laughs> I was going to make some space for the, uh, <laughs> for the uh, beautiful mountain. <laughs> Mount Hood in all of its glory in March in Oregon. All right. Well, thanks for checking in. Um, feel free to subscribe on my YouTube channel. And also, I now have a sub stack. Um, so I, I'm, I'm producing more of these videos and I'm really enjoying it. And I also just started writing again. And my sub stack is Reeling. That's R-E-A-L-I-N-G. Reeling, like being real, becoming more real or reality. So it's reeling.substack.com or just search my name. If you search Annika Mangan, uh, you'll find me. So thank you for checking in. See you next time.